I've learned a lot. Reverend David Shaw has been in communication with his spirit guide since he was three years old, when his guardian angel saved his life for the first time. When he was in his teens, spirit told Reverend David that he would become a healer. And when he was getting his first spiritual healing certification in his 30s, spirit said that he would become a minister. Reverend David completed that prophecy by being ordained at Center of Enlightenment in October of 2017. He is also certified as a Reiki master in 1999 and as a medium in 2016. Reverend David has been attending the Center of Enlightenment since May of 2015. He is currently serving as a president on COE Board of Direction, Directors. Help me in welcoming Reverend David Shaw. Well, thank you, Reverend Gina. You're welcome. Thank you. You're welcome. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Today, I won't explain to you how Christmas trees are grown, mainly because the song just did it. With sunshine, raindrops, friendship, and kindness. And most of all, they need love, as do we all. Excuse me. So a week ago, Spirit told me to talk with you today about the winter solstice. And that's what I told Reverend Gina. And then last Wednesday, of course, they changed it a little bit. A little this time, usually, <coughs> sometimes, well, not usually, sometimes it's a completely different topic. Especially surprising if it's Saturday morning. <laughs> Last, so last Wednesday, they said, we're going to talk about why we use Christmas trees, not why we grow them. And that comes out of the winter solstice traditions, so that makes sense, and there I will begin. Long before the advent of Christianity, plants and trees that remained green year-round had a special meaning for people in the winter. Just as people today decorate their homes during the festive season with pine, spruce, and fir, Many aged peoples hung evergreen boughs over their doors and windows. In many countries, it was believed the evergreens would keep away witches, ghosts, evil spirits, and illnesses. And this happened everywhere in the Northern Hemisphere and everywhere in the Southern Hemisphere, six months opposite. At least that's what they've discovered in archaeological digs and stuff. So in the Northern Hemisphere, the shortest day and longest night of the year falls on December 21st or 22nd. And as you know, that's called the winter solstice. Many ancient people believe that the sun was a god and that winter came every year because the sun god had become sick and weak. Since the winter months are when they congregated together inside and infected each other, getting sick, I assume that's why they made the association. They celebrated the solstice because it meant that at last, the sun god would begin to get well. The days would get longer. Evergreen balls reminded them of all the green plants that would grow again when the sun god was strong and summer would return. So they displayed them in their homes and on their altars. Early Romans marked the solstice with a feast called Saturnalia in honor of their god Saturn who was the god of uh, agriculture. The Romans knew that after the solstice, farms and orchards would soon be green and fruitful again. To mark the occasion, they also decorated their homes and temples with evergreen boughs. In Northern Europe, the Druids, the priests of the ancient Celts, also decorated their temples with evergreen boughs as a symbol of everlasting life. Germany is credited with starting the Christmas tree tradition as we now know it. In the 16th century, when sources record devout Christians bringing decorated trees into their homes, some even built Christmas pyramids of wood and decorated them with evergreen and candles. That's not a fire hazard, is it? <laughs> it's the wily held belief that Martin Luther, the 16th century Protestant reformer, first added lighted candles to a tree 
According to a common version of the story, walking home one winter evening, Luther was awed by the stars twinkling amidst the evergreens. To recapture the scene for his family, he erected a tree in the main room and wired its branches with lighted candles. Now, most 19th century Americans found Christmas trees indoor an oddity. The first records of Christmas trees being cut for display in America comes from the 1820s in Pennsylvania's German communities, although trees may have been a traditionary even earlier. As early as 1747, Moravian Germans in Pennsylvania had a community tree in the form of a wooden pyramid, again decorated with candles. But as late as the 1840s, Christmas trees were still seen as pagan symbols and not accepted by most Americans. It's not surprising that like many other festive Christmas customs, the tree was adopted so late in America. We can blame this, or rather, this is because New England's first Puritan leaders viewed Christmas celebrations as unholy. The Pilgrim's second governor, William Bradford, wrote that he tried hard to stamp out pagan mockery of the observation, penalizing any frivolity. In 1659, the General Court of Massachusetts, which he was in control of, enacted a law making any observance of December 25th a penal offense. They even fined people for hanging decorations. That stern solemnity continued until the influx of German and Irish immigrants in the 19th century, bringing all their heritage and undermining that Puritan legacy. Thank goodness. In 1846, the popular royals Queen Victoria and her German Prince Albert were sketched in the Illustrated London News standing with their children around a Christmas tree. Unlike the previous royal family, Victoria was very popular with her audience, and so what she did immediately became fashionable at the court, not, and not only in Britain, but with fashion-conscious East Coast Americans as well. Finally, the Christmas tree had become popular in the English-speaking world. By the 1890s, Christmas ornaments were being shipped from Germany, and Christmas tree popularity was on rise across the U.S. Historians note that Europeans used small trees, about four feet in height, while Americans like theirs all the way to the ceiling, filling the whole place. We've had both styles, being empty nesters. Right now we have one of those needle trees. It's about 18 inches wide at the bottom, but it fits. And it's got ornaments on it. That's what counts. That's my Harry Potter and Hagrid and Hedwig uh, ornaments on it. <laughs> um, I think Patty got those, but I claimed them. <laughs> the earliest 20th century saw Americans decorating the trees mainly with homemade ornaments. While many German Americans continued to use apples, nuts, and marzipan cookies. String popcorn was added to trees decoration after being dyed bright colors and interlaced with berries and nuts. Electricity brought Christmas lights, making it possible for the trees to glow for days on end and increase the fire hazards. With this, Christmas trees began to appear in town squares across the country, and having a Christmas tree in the home became an American tradition. Oh, there it is, okay. I added something and I couldn't find it. Christmas trees are also popular around the world. German settlers began migrating to Canada from the United States in the 1700s. They brought Canada's first Christmas trees and in later generations, gingerbread houses and advent calendars, which I had never heard of those until I watched Hallmark movies. <laughs> in most Mexican homes, the principal holiday adornment is the Nascimento, the nativity scene. However, a decorated Christmas tree may be incorporated in the nascimento or set up elsewhere in the house. As purchase of a natural pine presents a luxury too expensive for most Mexican families, the typical arbolito, 
otherwise known as little tree, is often an artificial one, or they use a branch cut from a copal tree, or some type of shrub corrected, collected from the countryside. After all, it's not what you have, it's what you put on it. You know, the ornaments. So until I was six, we had a real tree in the living room. And then the Sears Wish Book, a printed on paper catalog for those unfamiliar with the idea, arrived with a silver tree on the cover. My mom had to have it. So my dad went out and bought it, and they got new blue ornaments and a spotlight with a plastic disc with different colors on it. And so that got set up in the living room in the front of the front window. Now, we ended up using the blue filter only because the red and blue ornaments that, no, even the green one was pretty ridiculous. So anyway, my dad still wanted a real tree, so they set that up in the basement. And that worked because we'd have a party on Christmas Eve for my dad's side of the family. And then on Christmas night, we'd have one for my mom's side. So they did that like for another five years until it got to be too much. And then uh, the aluminum tree got old and we got live ones again in the living room for a while. And then that was too much work. And we got the ones where you just push the branches together. That was my mom's favorite because all you had to do was fluff it and it's ready to go. The aluminum one, you had to put each branch in a paper sleeve, and then when you took it out for the next year, you had to pull off the sleeve and stick it in the spot and make sure it was the right one because, you know, the different lengths. And, man, those were complicated. Speaking of real trees, the Norway spruce is a traditional species used to decorate homes in Britain. The Norway spruce was a native species in the British Isles before the last ice age and then it was reintroduced there before the 1500s. Since, speaking of ice, since icy Greenland lacks large native forests, most Christmas trees are imported. They decorate with candles and bright ornaments as well. Now this one is important. Norwegians often take a trip to the woods to select a Christmas tree a trip that their grandfathers probably didn't make because the Christmas tree was not introduced into Norway from Germany until the latter half of the 19th century. Many families decorate their trees on Little Christmas Eve, December 23rd. A Norwegian ritual known as circling the Christmas tree follows, where everyone joins hands to form a ring around the tree and then walks around it singing carols. My wife and I, this is important because my wife and I just watched a Hallmark movie, Christmas movie last Thursday about Christmas in Norway. And they did that tradition. So you can take that one with gospel. As I mentioned earlier, many Christmas traditions practiced around the world today started in Germany, like the Lutheran religion crediting Martin Luther with placing the first lighted candles on a Christmas tree. Another German story says that in the early 16th century, people combined two customs that had been practiced in different countries around the globe. The paradise tree, a fir tree originally decorated with communion wafers, but later changed to apples, represented the tree of knowledge in the Garden of Eden. And I think that started in Italy. I couldn't get a clear uh, lineage on it. The Christmas light, a small parallel frame, usually decorated with glass balls, tinsel, and a candle on top, was the symbol of the birth of Christ as the light of the world. Now that was a German invention. By changing the tree's apples to tinsel, balls, and candles, and then combining this new tree with the light placed on the star, on the top, that's where we get the star, the Germans created the tree that many of us use and know today. Now regarding artificial trees, more than 80% of them are made in China, but a much smaller percentage of Chinese people celebrate Christmas as a religious holiday. Those who do often put up these artificial trees, trees of lights, as they call them, decorated with paper chains and lanterns. And for most of the Japanese who celebrate Christmas, 
It's purely a secular holiday devoted to the love of their children. Christmas trees are decorated with small toys, dolls, paper ornaments, wind chimes, and gold paper fans and lanterns. Miniature candles are also put among the tree branches. One of the most popular ornaments is the origami crane, a symbol of hope and peace. Japanese children have exchanged thousands of folded paper birds of peace with young people all over the world as a pledge that war must not happen again. Oh, that that would be true. One of Patty's nieces went to Japan as a high school exchange student, and she asked people to assist her in folding a thousand cranes for her to take to Hiroshima to leave at the Peace Memorial. She reached her goal, filling a whole suitcase by itself with cranes, and I'm proud to say that I folded ten for her. Could have done more, but I couldn't do more. So anyway, that's these hands. So that's the history of how the winter solstice came to be and how using a tree to celebrate Christ's birth was included in those traditions. Oh, they're telling me to do the other thing. Um, one more reason that the evergreens are of significance in Christianity's celebration of the birth of Christ is because they're evergreen, they also signify rebirth. So there's the birth, and then at the end of his existence on earth, there's the rebirth. So the evergreens combine the whole <coughs> gamut. So I thought of that this morning. Thank you for your time, and thank you for your attention. Thank you.